afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. This is Point of View, and it's just me right now. So I know Cleester's working. I know Yul is working today. And so it looks like it's just me. I haven't heard from Aretha yet. So God willing, I'll hear from her today. And it's a wonderful day. This is Tuesday. It is the 7th of February in the year 2023. And I am happy and thankful that God has allowed me to come to you on Point of View with Shirley, Cleasa, Yola, and Maritha. So my topic today is uh, I'm going to talk about people in history, uh, African uh, ethnicity, African and American uh, that have not many of us probably might not have heard of before. So I'm going to talk about those. There are 34 of them, so I'll get as many as I can today. Dear God, as I sit before you to speak, I pray to you that my soul you will keep. And if I should die before I finish, I pray to you, dear God, in the name of Jesus, that any outstanding sins will be forgiven. And I hope my camera, I don't know whether my camera is going to hold up. It's been acting up on me, but I am going to go ahead and I'm going to pull out of this because I hear an echo, so I'm gonna leave there. So, yeah, the echo is gone now. So thank you so much for being with me today. It's just a privilege and a blessing. It's just a privilege and a blessing. And let me see, I said I was gonna pray. Did I pray? If I didn't, I'm going to now. <laughs> Dear, sometimes my mind is moving so fast, I have to catch up with, with it. Oh, Dear God, as, we, as I sit before you to speak, I pray to you that my soul you will keep and if I should die before I finish, I pray to you, dear God, in the name of Jesus, that any outstanding sins will be forgiven. Amen. I am going to go to this and I want to share this screen today with you. I'm going to share a screen with you today and uh, I am going to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. So it's very interesting and I am I am happy that I came across it. I'm always, always wanting to share and uh, share what I have learned and what I'm learning. And so I'm going to talk about the people, uh, some of the people that we haven't heard of. Now, some of the people on here, as I was studying it, I did here. I had heard about some of these people, but some of them I have not heard about. So it was very, very interesting, very interesting. So I am going to go on with this. And this is Reader's Digest. What I'm getting this from is Reader's Digest. So I'm going to go ahead with it. And uh, you'll see some ads on here, but that's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. This is Reader's Digest, and it's talking about left out of out of the history books. If you can see that, and I'll come back to that. And uh, it's I think it said 34, 35 Black Americans you didn't learn about in history by Tamara Gain, G A N E. It's about time these incredible Americans get the acknowledgement they deserve. And I'm going to go ahead, left out of the history books. For too many years, history books have focused on the achievement of white Americans, while many of the inspiring contributions of American, African Americans and others have been tragically overlooked. From comedians to doctors to astronauts and entrepreneurs, the achievement of these black history figures paved the way for all who followed in their footsteps. So if you're looking for ways to celebrate Black History Month, learning the names of these amazing trailblazers is a good place to start. Yes, it is. So we're going to go to Rebecca Crumpler. So more people should know the name Rebecca Lee Crumpler, and she lived from 1831 to 1895. So Crumpler was the first Black American woman physician. 
okay, that we know of, okay, that they know of as far as their history goes back. I'll say it like that, okay, because we know we had them way back then, way back then. We might not know their names, but we had them, and they might not have classified them as physicians, but they were called healers, and, and uh, then they called them other kinds of doctors and different things like that. So I'm going with this, which is a very good piece, okay? Crumpler was the first Black, according to this piece, first African-American woman physician and we could say recognized, okay, by many. So she became a doctor of medicine in New England Female Medical College in 1864, just a year before the end of the Civil War. She spent her career focusing on the care of women, children, and people of color unable to pay for medical services, fighting racism and sexism every step of the way. So in 1883, she published a book called A Book of Medical Discourses in Two Parts, which many historians believe to be the first medical text by, black America, by a Black American writer. So I'm going to read this like this person wrote it, but I don't like to say Black American because we're brown. We're different, all different hues of brown. Now, there are some people in the world who are literally black. Literally, because I've seen them. They're so black, they look blue. But that's not us, okay? Now, all right, I had to say that piece. So you might not have heard her name until now, but spread it far and wide because Crumpler is one of the pioneering women who changed the world and one of the most inspiring black history figures. Then we come to Mary McLeod Bethune. We've heard of her before, Miss Tapp. Both Mary McLeod Bethune's 1875 to 1955 parents were formerly enslaved. Despite this, Bethune became one of the most important and inspiring leaders in education, women's rights, and civil rights. Bethune was one of 17 children, and she grew up picking cotton alongside her family. She eventually went to boarding school and became a teacher. She married another teacher, and the pair moved to Florida, where Bethune opened a boarding school of her own, the Industrial School for Training Negro Girls. The school eventually merged with an all-male school and became the Bethune-Cookman College in 1929. Bethune didn't stop there. She was a champion of women's rights, worked in President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration as a director of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration and served as vice president in the National Association of the Advancement of Colored Persons. Her tireless efforts helped ensure she left behind a better world than the one she was born into. And then there are some heartwarming stories of teachers who changed lives also. And this is from Reader's Digest, as you can see right here. Then we go to Margaret Strickland Collins. Margaret Strickland Collins. So I want to check here, make sure my camera's not acting up because it has been acting up on me when I was uh, studying today. So, uh, and I always test my camera, so I want to make sure, but these, we're talking about people we might not have heard about in school. We have so many people of our persuasion, uh, African descendants, and then we're all, uh, we're so mixed up with different uh, ethnic groups. Uh, first Native American, then Asian American, we're all mixed up. So we are gifted there. there. We, I, I'm just so happy to present this. And this is Heritage Month. This is our, we're Heritage Month. The whole month of February is recognized as, as uh, they call it Black History Month. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go with Margaret Strickland Collins. And I, I don't see her picture. 
It was obvious Margaret Strickland Collins, and she lived from 1922 to 1966, excuse me, was brilliant and motivated at a very young age. She grew up in Institute, West Virginia, a community largely comprised of black intellectuals, skipping two grades to graduate high school at the age of 14. She promptly started college earning a degree in biology. She went on to study entomology and earn her PhD at the University of Chicago. She spent much of her career studying termites as a research fellow for the Smithsonian Institute, which now houses a collection devoted to her work. She was also a civil rights activist, becoming one of the many ordinary people who changed the world when she stepped up to drive people back and forth. Okay, so excuse me, I want to do this. I'm going to cut my mic off there just for a little bit. I have to check my notifications. Okay, now, thank you so much for your patience. Now, I'm going to go back in there. Alexa, Alexa, cancel. All right, I told her I didn't want to hear that, but she didn't hear me, evidently. Now, talking about Strickland here. Oh, wow. She skipped two grades. She promptly started college, and we talk about how she studied the termites. Now, we go to this man right here. This is Benjamin Banneker, and we've heard of Banneker, many of us, because he was in the history books, some of the history books. So, Benjamin Banneker's 1731 to 1806 father, his father was formerly enslaved and his mother was a former indentured servant, though Banneker himself was born free. He was self-educated, but his lack of formal education didn't hold him back. Banneker became a sayer, astronomer, and most notably a writer of almanacs in his in his almanacs, okay? Banneker included personal writings, title information, title, T-I-D-A-L information, medical information, astronomical calculations, and information on insects like bees and locusts. He was also an outspoken abolitionist who exchanged letters with Thomas Jefferson, who was Secretary of State at the time. Oh, that, wow, that is so neat, the almanac, and we all have used that almanac. I Hey, I don't have one right now, not an up-to-date one, but I sure I'm going to look for one. Next, here she is. Her name is Elizabeth Freeman. Elizabeth Freeman. Less than a year after Massachusetts adopted the state constitution, a woman no one had heard of did an extraordinary thing. Orig born Mom Bet, Elizabeth Freeman, and she lived from 1774 to 1829, was enslaved, but she filed a legal challenge citing the document's promise of liberty and won her freedom in court. How about that? Isn't that something to learn? She became the first woman to successfully file a lawsuit for her right to freedom in the state of Massachusetts. How about that, man? That's some great information. So this groundbreaking moment established a pathway for a host of subsequent suits and eventually prompted the Massachusetts Judicial Court to outlaw slavery altogether. After earning her freedom, Bet changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman and worked as a 
domestic worker, midwife, healer, and nurse. Her efforts paid off and she was eventually able to buy her own home, her own home, okay? Freeman's story is one of many facts about Black History Month you didn't learn in school. I'd never heard of her before, but then also as I was reading this earlier today, and a free man, that means she was free, she was a free man, even that free man, okay, free man, how about that? So hey, it's not a, uh, what is it, a unique revelation, but I, you know, we go over the word Freeman, Freeman, we say Freeman, 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 like that, we're free man. So that means she filed, she's a free, free, free lady. And now this lady right here, this is Mae Jemison. And I believe I've heard this name before. I have, I have, yes, I have. In, in every famous woman in flight, there are sadly countless others whose names are not nearly as well known. Among them is Mae Jemison. Uh, she was born in 1956. And Jemison became the first black woman in space in 1992 as an astronaut on the second launch of the space shuttle Endeavour. This achievement is even more admirable when you consider the fact that Jemison was afraid of heights. Jemison was successful at an early age, starting Stanford University when she was just 16 years old. This is some great information. In 1991, she earned her doctorate of medicine from Cornell University. Afterwards, she served two years in the Peace Corps. She established a private practice and subsequently joined, in, joined NASA upon her return. And if that wasn't cool enough, she also accepted an offer to guest star on Star Trek, Star Trek the next generation, which was a meaningful, which was meaningful because the original series was a favorite of hers as a child. That's amazing. Now we come up with another. You, I told you to see these ads. This person right here that you see is George Carruthers. This is George Carruthers. OK, we're talking about people that we might not have heard about in the history classes in school. OK, or anywhere else. We might not have heard of them because I don't remember hearing of George Carruthers anywhere because there are so many people that have done so many fantastic things and then were deliberately left out of history because someone else wanted the credit. We know all about that, don't we? George Carruthers. When people think of NASA, they usually think of what it is like to be an astronaut or spend a day inside the International Space Station. But many of the heroes of NASA never leave the ground. And sometimes we don't think about that, do we? Many of the heroes of NASA never leave the ground. One such person is physicist George Carruthers, and he was born in 1939. Carruthers built his own telescope when he was 10 years old and started working at U.S. Naval Research Library as a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow after he earned his PhD from the University of Illinois. In 1969, he was awarded a patent for an ultraviolet violet camera it was used in 1972 during the first moonwalk of Apollo 16, allowing scientists to analyze the atmosphere in more detail than ever before. I didn't know it. Did you know it? What I'm going to do here is go and, and put this on um, fake, um, uh, go to my Facebook page so I can monitor myself here. Thank you so much for being with me today. This is some great, great information. And I can also monitor this camera also because my camera has been acting up on me today. It has been acting up. 
go oh. to my Facebook page. Oh, so okay, I here. Monitor myself. All right, I had to tur turn that down. So I'm seeing it's working okay. Thank you, God. Because I tell you, I was concerned about this. I like for my equipment to work like it should. Okay, now. So he made a, a color camera, ultraviolet camera. And they used it in 1972 with Apollo 16. That's amazing. That is super. I'm so excited about this. So excited about this. I'm so excited about this. Hello. Um, I want to say hello to everyone who's with me today. Thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate it. So I'm, I'm just uh, uh, keeping up with everything and trying to keep up with everybody also that's watching because I truly, truly appreciate you. And like I said, I'm solo today. <laughs> So low today, but I've done it for years. So hey, it's nothing new to me, okay? But I do miss my sisters and and Eula's our sister cousin too. So I miss them. I miss them so much. In later years, he continued to develop inventions for a NASA program and and paid it forward by developing an apprenticeship program that gave high school students the chance to work at the U.S. Naval Laboratory. In 2003, he was inducted in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That's wonderful. Our next is right here, this gentleman right here. That is Ralph Bunch. And we've heard of Ralph Bunch before. Many of us have heard of him. So, Ralph Bunch. Many people believe that Martin Luther King Jr. was the first African American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. But that's one of many facts about Dr. King that isn't true. You hear that? Dr. King, according to this article and according to history, was not the first of us to win the Nobel Peace Prize. That honor goes to Ralph Bunch, 1904 is when he was born and he died in 1971, a name that is tragically underrecognized. Bunch was valedictorian of his class in both high school and college and went on to earn a doctorate in political science at Harvard University. He was the key participant in drafting and adopting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights alongside Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow, that is amazing. Now, in 1947, his with the United Nations led him to the daunting role of working on a team tasked with alleviating the Arab-Israeli conflict in Palestine. It was this work he was awarded the it was for this that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950. Later in life, he worked to promote civil rights in the United States, participating in historic events like the March on Washington and the Montgomery bus boycott. And oh, I have some good information about that bus uh, boycott too. Now we go to Mark Dean, Mark Dean. And so if you're, if you're reading this, on a personal computer computing device. This is this is super too. Oh my, you've got Mark Dean, born in 1957, to thank. You hear that? The scientist and inventor was a trailblazer in the field of computing. Talking about people of African persuasion, African uh, with ethnicity, African Americans, anybody with African. Uh, Africans as descendants, we're talking about us today. People who they did not put in the history, or we they might be in books, but we didn't hear about them. Many of them we did not hear about. And this, this being Heritage Month, this is super. Mark Dean, the scientist and inventor, was a trailblazer in the field of computing. Dean discovered he had a knack for working his hands with his hands from a young age, once helping his father assemble a tractor from scratch. He studied engineering in college, 
college and started working with EM soon after earning his degree at IBM. Dean quickly moved up the ranks and developed three. He developed three of the co company's nine original patents. Among his projects were the first color computer monitor and the first gigahertz chip. How about that? Which performs a billion calculations a second. Oh my goodness. This is amazing, isn't it? Now, here we come to that Madam C.J. Walker, and we've heard of Madam C.J. Walker. That's the press and comb and all that that we used to use and some still do. And OK. All right. And then the products that she had, Madam C.J. Walker, she was born in 1867. She died in 1919, was raised in poverty, but went on to become one of the wealthiest and most influential women of her era. She was born Sandra Breedlove. Oh, she might be kin to us. Wow. She was born Sandra Breedlove. We're, we're uh, Breedloves also by heritage. Sandra Breedlove. She was born Sandra Breedlove to a sharecropper parents, to sharecropper parents who had both been previously enslaved. One of the first steps on her way to success was finding work as a sales agent for a product that was formulated in formulated to restore hair. This was important to, to Walker since she was experiencing hair loss herself. Eventually, she took one dollar and twenty five cents and used it used it to found her own hair care line. But back then, $1.25 was a lot of money. She took that $1.25 and used it and founded her own hair care line. How about that? Focusing on products for African-American hair. She believed Black women should be financially independent and provided training and sales jobs for over 40,000 African American individuals. She eventually became a millionaire and paid it forward with contributions to the YMCA, scholarships for African American students, the NAACP, and more. When she died, it was revealed she left two thirds of her future profits to various charities. My goodness, that is wonderful. Paying it forward. Now we go to a man called William H. Carney. William H. Carney was the first black soldier to win the Medal of Honor. How about that? It's no secret that the contributions of black soldiers in the Civil War have been shamefully overlooked, which is why it isn't surprising that many people haven't heard of William H. Carney. And he was born in 1840 and he left us, died in 1908. The first black soldier to win the Medal of Honor he was born enslaved. Corny was a fighter from an early age, escaping as a young man and finding his way to freedom through the Underground Railroad. Although he originally felt called to become a minister, when he learned troops comp comprised of Black soldiers were forming to fight in the Civil War, he felt compelled to join. Corny was promoted to sergeant and awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroic actions in the 1863 Battle of Fort Wagner, in which he made sure his reg never reached the ground despite being shot four times. My goodness. One thing about if we're in, we're in for the long haul. And we don't just consider ourselves, we consider everybody involved. And you know this picture right here, that's Mom's Mabley. And oh yes, we used to listen to her. Daddy and Mama had albums of Mom's Mabley. And we sit and listen to those records. And and, and I told one thing uh, on one of Mom's Mabley's uh, records that she was talking about. 
this uh, young girl, they went to her and she said, she said, baby, what's the matter? And she said, I'm in love. She said, why? How do you know you're in love? <laughs> Say the girl said, I can't eat. I can't sleep. And she said, baby, you got indigestion. <laughs> so anyway, that's one of the favorites of mom's babies that I like. So thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate you being here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So mom's Mabley. A comedy is notoriously, uh, comedy is a notoriously difficult field to break into a fact only amplified if you happen to, to be a woman, but alone, black, alone, a black woman in the early days of stand up in vaudeville, okay? Let alone being one of us in the early days of vaudeville. So that didn't stop Moms Mabley. She was born in 1894, she died in 1975. She was born Loretta Aiken and suffered the premature deaths of both her parents at a age. She was impregnated twice through the violence of rape and gave birth to children who were taken away at 14. My goodness. She joined at 14, uh, that were taken away, excuse me. Now at 14, she, bore, she joined the African-American vaudeville circuit. She went on to be the first woman featured on stage at the prestigious Apollo Theater and was invited back so many times she appeared more than any other performer. She had featured roles in movies, recorded gold comedy albums, and appeared on television shows like the Smother Bro Smothers Brothers and Ed Sullivan. And those of us around my age, we remember those shows, don't we? Okay. Next, this gentleman here. All right, he has a very interesting story. George Follis. NFL fans today might have a difficult time imagining an era when football wasn't integrated, but was once the case. Um, uh, it was once the case until Charles Follis, and who was born in 1879 and died in 1910, became the first Black American professional football player. How about that? Now, Follis was a gifted athlete who played football in high school and joined an amateur league in college. In 1904, he signed on with the Shelby Athletic Club in Ohio to become the first professional black football player. Thank you for being with me. I appreciate you so much. Opposing players frequently went out of their way, and, and this is to be I figured this while I was reading. It said the the players, opposing players, frequently went out of their way to injure him with excessively rough play, and he was subjected by taunts and racial slurs from fans of other teams. An injury ended his football career, and joined he joined the Cuban Giants a black baseball team. He died of pneumonia at the age of 31. He died young, didn't he? But he accomplished so much during his lifetime. Here's another lady right here. Jane Bolin. Jane Bolin, 1903 to, to 2007. She stood apart from the crowd at an early age, a brilliant student. She graduated from Wellesley, Wellesley College in 1928, despite experiencing racism and isolation from her classmates. She went on to be the first woman to graduate from Yale Law School and at age 31, became the first black woman in the country to be sworn in as a judge. She didn't give up. She did not give up. She retired from the bench at age 70 and focused on volunteer work for local schools. Oh, there's so much more about her. So it said, if you want to follow her footsteps, start with these 15 creative ways to volunteer and make a difference. Next, this gentleman right here is Matthew Henson. 
That is Matthew Henson. Expeditions tried to reach the North Pole for 18 years, but were always unsuccessful due to the brutal cold and untamed conditions. Navy Lieutenant Robert Peary led the first expedition to finally reach the North Pole. By his side was Matthew Henson, 1866 to 1955 is his lifespan, an African-American explorer born to free sharecroppers. Perry learned the Inuit language of the natives in the area, which proved, which proved key to his success. In addition, he mastered several Intuit survival techniques and had superior dog sledding and navigational skills. In 1912, Henson published a book about the adventures, about his adventures. One is entitled Negro Explorer of the North Pole and went on to receive a Congressional Medal and a Presidential Citation in 1950. Wow, my goodness. Next, there's a lady right there. And she looks like she's a thinker too. Mary Ellen Pleasant. Mary Ellen Pleasant. There's she right there. No one is positive if Mary Ellen Pleasant, 1810 to 1904, was born free or into slavery. But her adult years were well documented. Pleasant was a brilliant and creative entrepreneur. And despite the barriers in place for African Americans and women in general, managed to become one of the first female African-American self-made millionaires in our nation's history. She moved to California during the gold rush and found employment as a domestic worker where she was generally disregarded and treated like she was invisible by her employers. She used this to her advantage. So you have to think, you have to think, you have to use what's in that noggin, okay? We have to think, that's why I say we are resilient. We are still here despite all of the tactics and the evil that has been put on us, toward us, we are still here. We're still here. Yes, we are resilient. God meant for us to be here and he meant for us to accomplish the things that we have accomplished and even the, the half has not been told. That's why I'm so thankful that I came across this, this article here. They say she used this to her advantage because people, you know, they look those domestic workers, uh, you know, they, they some people regard them as nobody. So they just, they just say anything before while they're in the room and just do all kinds of stuff thinking that they're nobodies and hey they can't do any harm they they don't know any better and all that but she used that to her advantage listening in on their conversations and gathering tips on stocks and investments in real estate and gold and silver mines she eventually bought several boarding houses and lawn businesses and often disguised herself as a menial, menial worker in order to continue to have access to hot tips. That lady was smart. And uh, Glenda has, Glenda has, oh, well, it, there's a book out. And in that book, she has, there was a, a woman an entrepreneur character in her book. And the woman told how she stays in the successful range that she's in using what's in between all of here. OK, yes, you have to use use what you've got. Yes, yes, yes. I like this. She disguised herself as a menial labor 
worker in order to continue to have access to hot tips. She used some of her fortunes to support the Underground Railroad and abolitionist causes. Unfortunately, there, here we go. Unfortunately, she fell victim to vicious rumors and scrupulous, unscrupulous business partners. And ultimately, she died in poverty. We have to be so careful. We have to be so careful. We have to be so careful. Now, this man right here, this is super. Uh, this man right here is Bayard Rustin. There he is right there. I never heard of him before. Okay. Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin, from he was born in 1912 and died in 1987, was a... Uh, Gay and African American, which meant he faced discrimination on many levels. Nevertheless, he contributed greatly to forward progress and the cause of equality in the country. Rustin was one of the key organizers for the March on Washington, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his history-making I Have a Dream speech. His work went largely unrecognized at the time, but in 2003, he was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama for his work. And he's one of the 13 amazing LGBTQ plus heroes you didn't learn about in history class. All right, now here's a lady right here. Ursula Burns, there she is. I want you to see her picture again. Ursula Burns, okay? Ursula Burns, 1958 to present, became one of the women CEOs who made history when she was named CEO of the Xerox Corporation in 2007, making her the first African-American woman to hold such a position in Fortune 500 company, in a Fortune 500 company. Her creative and out-of-the-box leadership helped change the company from a mediocre performer focusing on copy machines and yesterday's hardware to a globally competitive high-tech company focusing on innovating software and cloud technology. Oh, let me show you her again. That's Ursula Burns. And I remember, I remember when she was appointed to that position. Yes, I do. Okay. Let's go on. My time is moving on and I'm making good time, huh? This gentleman right here is Robert Sinkstacky Abbott. Sinkstacky Abbott. Now, he was born in 1870 and he died in 1940. He was a founder of the Chicago Defender in 1905. It started as a four-page paper printed with almost entirely borrowed money. At first, Abbott served as photographer, as the editor, and reporter, but slowly began to attract volunteers willing to share the workload as the paper expanded. The Chicago Defender reported on issues important to the black community, including riots and lynchings and encouraged African Americans living under the Jim Crow laws in the South to make their way up north. Many credit the Chicago Defender for paving the way for other prominent black focused publications such as Ebony and Essence. Wow. We salute you, Robert Abbott. Along with all the rest. Now, here's another lady. See our picture? Okay. That's Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin. Now, this is very interesting. This is so interesting because my daughter had told me that there was someone else before Rosa Parks. See, a lot of this we do not get. Okay. But this is Claudette Colvin. Rosa Parks 
is famous for launching the Montgomery bus boycott when she refused to give up her seat and moved to the back of the bus for a white passenger. But before Rosa Parks, there was Claudette Colvin, 1935. Okay, that's when she was born. Colvin was just 15 years old when she refused to give up her seat for a white passenger nine months before Rosa Parks did the same thing. The school girl was handcuffed, arrested, and thrown in jail. She subsequently participated in a court case that outlawed bus segregation in Montgomery and Alabama. Okay, Calvin's story is one of the many facts you didn't know about Black History Month. Oh, this is this is so good, isn't it? And the time is really moving on, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with me. I didn't hear my sister come in. So I'm going to continue. She didn't come in. So I'm going back to the facts. OK, this lady right here. Her name is Gwendolyn Brooks. Now, we've heard of Gwendolyn Brooks before. Many of us have. 1917 to 2000. What she was born. She was a groundbreaking African American poet. For the most part, she didn't write about flowery subjects. Instead, her prose shined a light on the civil rights movement and uh, the poor economic conditions forced on many Black Americans. So I, I just want to put this in here. I had a, a thing between economic and economic, but you can say either are, okay? I saw that in the dictionary, okay? <laughs> All right, so now I don't have a problem. So if I say eek or ick, they're both right. All right? So she was the first Black writer to be advanced, uh, or excuse me, please, she was the first Black writer to be awarded the prestigious Pulitzer Prize and the first Black woman to serve in the role of poetry consultant for the Library of Congress. She was a fierce advocate for other poets and often visited schools to teach workshops and despite being far from wealthy, selflessly used her own money to establish prizes to support the poetry communications. And I want to say, uh, our community, I want to say something about the Library of Congress. When I was uh, doing, when we did our first album, The Inspiration of God Singers, a lady would call me because I was doing the copyright, getting the copyright, and a lady called me at my job. I was working at Johnson Johnson. She would call me early in the morning. I would go in the office and she would work with me until she got that album copyrighted from the Library of Congress. And so the inspiration of God, singers, the the that album is in the Library of Congress, and we are, I have a copyright on that material. And I just want to say about the Library of Congress, I have had dealings with the Library of Congress. Now here's this lady, okay? Alice Coachman. I don't remember hearing her name either, but there are many Olympic moments that changed history. Many that changed history. Arguably, one of the most important is Alice Coachman became the first black woman in the world to win a gold medal in the 1948 Summer Olympics in England. Isn't that wonderful? King George VI personally presented her with her winning medal and her hometown of Albany, Georgia threw a parade in her honor when she returned home. Still, Racism marred that happy day when the event was segregated and the mayor refused to shake her hand. Coachman went on to become a teacher and established a foundation to give back to those in need. We have some terrible acting people in this world, don't we? It's not the world is bad. It's the people in the world. So many of the people in the world. Okay. 
So many of the people just mean and hate. Now, this man right here is Garden Parks. Garden Parks, okay? He looks like a cool dude, doesn't he? All right. Thank you for being with me. I really appreciate you. I love you all. Thank you. Talking about people we might not have heard about in school or in the books. Uh, and I haven't heard of most of these people, okay? I won't get all of them today or so. I will probably do a part two. And on, on Thursday, Esther will be with us, God willing. Okay, Garden Parks. If you're a fan of arrestingly beautiful photos that stand the test of time, you'll want to check out the work of photographer Garden Parks. And he lived from 1912 to 2006. Parks took some of the most iconic photos of his generation for publications like Life Magazine, Time, and Ebony. When he, when he directed the movie Shaft, he became the first African-American to direct a major motion picture. Parks also felt he was doing something more important than just taking photos. He was using the camera to change hearts and minds by circumventing, no, documenting the injustices of his time. He famously said that he used his camera to fight against poverty, racism, and social wrongs. Oh yeah, oh, and uh, thank you, sir, for your photography. This couple right here, very interesting, very interesting. We know about things like this. Mildred Jeter Loving. Mildred Jeter Loving. It may be hard to believe, but interracial marriage was once a crime punishable by law. And don't get it twisted. Today, in some people's minds, it's still a crime, okay? even though it might not be on the books in every state, but to some people in their minds, it is still punishable and by the outlaw, okay? All right, so don't get it twisted. Always be mindful, okay, of your surroundings, whoever you are. Don't take things for granted because there are some people out there with some solid minds Okay. All right. So in 1958, Mildred Jeter Loving, she lived from 1939 to 2008, who was of African American and Native American descent, married Richard Loving, a white man. The newlywed told they, were, they would face prison time if they didn't leave the state of Virginia. They left their home and she gave birth to birth to three children. However, they longed to return to their home state. Loving eventually wrote a letter to Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who connected her with the American Civil Liberties Union. That's the ACLU, okay? The Loving's case eventually landed with the U.S. Supreme Court, who unanimously ruled that laws barring interracial marriages were unconstitutional. At last, the Lovings could return home, and more importantly, they opened the door to other couples to marry the person they loved, regardless of skin color. Didn't know that. Mildred Jeter, Loving, she is the one that got done. Okay, this gentleman right here, is Charles Hamilton Houston. Charles Hamilton Houston lived from 1895 to 1950. He was a black attorney and worked tirelessly to fight for civil rights and overturn the bigoted laws of Jim Crow. He was part of nearly every Supreme Court case concerning civil rights during his era, including the landmark case, Brown versus the Board of Education. He became known as the man who killed Jim Crow. How about that? And this man's name is Charles Hamilton Houston. 
All right. In honor of his tireless work to make our country a fair country for every single citizen, regardless of color, Howard University, where Houston was once taught, named a hall for him and Harvard Law named an institute and a professor after him. Oh, wow. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Next. And this will be the last one. And you know who this is, don't you? Many of you, Ethel Waters, okay? Ethel Waters was born in 19, 1896, and she, she died in 1977. She was an influential vaudeville performer who went on to have a stellar career on Broadway. She was also a Grammy-winning recording artist whose vocal style was off imitated by her contemporaries. She also starred in movies and was nominated for an Academy Award for the movie Pinky in 1942. In 1950, Elta Waters became the first Black American to lead a television program, and she was the first Black actor to win an Emmy Award. All right, you got that? All right. So, Later in life, she toured with Billy Graham using her musical talents to sing in his crusade. Isn't that wonderful? That is so good. I'm telling you, that is so good. And there's something that I want to do. I have two minutes. I have, uh, if I can get there, I don't know whether I can get over there or not. But uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to close this out. I'm going to stop sharing this. So let me get over here and do what I need to do with this. All right. Okay. Now I'm coming back to my page. And I want to say that I really, really, really thank you. I really thank you for just everything, for being here. And uh, it's just a wonderful thing. What I'm going to do is go here because I want to play my song. Just because you hear the silence doesn't mean that I'm being quiet. And this is very, very dear to me. The Lord blessed me to, to uh, compose this. It's prose. And um, it's... Let me see if I can if I can get it up here just because you hear. Yes, there it is. I want to bring this up and I want you to get. Um, OK, I'm going to play it for you and then I'm going to go out. OK, OK. OK, I'm going to start it again and then I'm going to close out with it okay let me get back here and i need to go in here where i can share it i'm going to share it with you and i want to say i thank you so much it's two o'clock and i want to play this for you as i go off thank you so much for being with me i love you so much Thank you. Please share this, okay? Talking about people that we never heard of before. Many of us hadn't heard of these people before, but I am so thankful that I got the opportunity to be able to learn about these people. All right. Talk with you later. Just because you hear the silence that doesn't mean that I'm being quiet. I'm praying. My head, my heart, my chest, my stomach, my hands, my knees, my ankles, my feet. Those visibly steady, many times they're uneasy in so many ways. My head sometimes feels as if a tsunami is active, all inside. And sometimes it seems that my heart is palpitating, oh so fast, 
and so wild. It hurts so bad. Can you feel? 